And I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. I want you to realize you're every bit as much a part of us as those who physically attend here. You see, our church is not restricted to just one physical location, but our church is everywhere as people go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Now, next week I'm going to start a series on the subject of racism, and I'm titling it The Bible and Racism. Because I really don't care what your opinion is, and you probably don't care what my opinion is. What we really want to know is, what does the Bible have to say about racism? And I'm going to start with the subject of slavery. Because many people, including Christians, erroneously believe that the Bible condoned slavery. And that's just not true. So that's where I'm going to start. And then I'm going to spin off of that and look at racism itself and what the Bible has to say about it. And then I'm going to talk about the rioting and the looting that's taking place in many cities across America. In fact, I'm going to go a little bit further and explain the purpose behind it. You know, most people don't understand why they're doing that. Now, let's be honest, 99% of them don't understand why they're doing it. Most of them are idiots, but the reason I say that's because they're burning down their own neighborhoods, if you wonder why I said that. But there are a few who are the instigators, and they have a purpose for inciting these riots. And if you don't understand what that purpose is, uh, you, you don't understand where you ought to be standing as a Christian and as a believer. So I'm going to reveal what the true purpose is behind the rioting. So make sure that you're here next week and that you attend all or you watch online all of the sermons in that series. Now, in the current, current series that we're in, we've been studying the role of a wife and her responsibilities. And according to Titus chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, a godly wife has six responsibilities. Or I should say six major responsibilities because those aren't the only responsibilities of wife, but they are the major responsibilities of wife. So if you would, go ahead and turn with me to Galatians. I'm sorry to Titus chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 and let's read that passage of scripture it says that they who does they refer to the older women if you read this in context you realize it's talking about older women it says that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands to love their children to be sensible pure workers at home being submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be dishonored so here are the six major responsibilities of a wife a godly wife. Number one, to love their husband. Number two, to love their children. Number three, to be sensible. Number four, to be pure. Number five, to guard the home. And last but not least, to be submissive to their husband. Now, so far we've covered five of the six responsibilities. So this morning I want to cover the last responsibility on the list, which is to be submissive to their husband. Now, there are three questions that I want to address this morning. Number one, what is submission? What does it mean when we say you need to submit? Number two, what are the principles of submission? Now, there are several principles of submission, but because of time and because of uh, just looking at what's important and what's not important, I'm only going to cover two this morning. And last but not least, why should a person submit to another person, to someone else? Why should we do that? So let's start with the first question. What is submission? Well, the word submission is translated from the Greek word hupotasso. And hupotasso is a compound word, which simply means that it's made up of more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. The prefix hupo, which means below, or I'm sorry, under. And the root word tasso, which means to place. Now, when you combine these two words together, it literally means to be placed under. Now, depending upon the context, it can mean one of two things. If we're talking about authority, it means that one person is under the authority of another. In other words, one person is in charge and everyone else is doing what they say. They're submissive to him or her. If we're talking about two equal parties making decisions or having to choose between several different options, it means that one person is deferring to the other. That's what submission means. In other words, one person is letting the other make the decisions or the choice. But regardless of this context or the context, submission always involves a hierarchy. A hierarchy. 
Someone's making the decisions or choices, and the others are deferring to that person. So here's a layman's definition of submission. If you want to write this in your Bible in Ephesians chapter 5, that chapter, because it talks about submission, I would write this definition down. It's a layman's definition. Submission is allowing someone else to decide or choose something. It's allowing someone else to decide or choose something. Now, let me give you some examples to illustrate the meaning of submission. Whenever Lisa and I go to Tulsa to visit the kids, we usually eat out. But someone has to decide where we're going to eat. And many times my kids, they want to eat at a restaurant that I really don't care for. I don't want to eat there. But someone has to make the choice. Someone has to decide. And I'm the patriarch of the family. And let's be honest, 90% of the time, I'm the one that's going to foot the bill. So you'd think that I'd be the one that made the decision, right? Well, you would be wrong. I don't. Why? Because it's not about me. It's about spending time with my children. So I defer to them. I let them choose. And people, that's what submission is all about. I'm placing what I want under what they want. And that's what the Greek word hupotasso means. Hupo means under, tasso means to place. So I'm placing what I want under what they want. I'm deferring to them. That's submission. Now let me give you another example. When it comes to shopping for furniture, my taste is completely different than Lisa's taste. I really don't care what it looks like as long as it's comfortable. Can I get an amen, man? Men? Yeah. In fact, what I like, Lisa usually laughs at. But I'm the man of the home, and let's be honest. I make the bulk of our income. So you would think that I'd be the one that gets to choose what furniture we're going to buy. You'd think that, right? Do you think that's the case? No, not at all. Because when it comes to buying furniture, I defer to Lisa. It's her choice. It's her decision. In fact, there's a hierarchy involved when it comes to buying furniture. What Lisa wants ranks higher than what Alan wants. Yeah, that's submission. You know, as I sit here and think about it, I realize that I submit more than anyone else in the family. Yeah. Just thinking about the hierarchy, it goes something like this. Mom, kids, grandkids, thank God we don't have dogs or cats, and dad. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? A benevolent father and a good husband will be the most submissive within the family. Let me say that again. A benevolent father and a good husband will be the most submissive within a family. It's true. And I'll explain why that is in just a little bit. But again, let me say this again, because men don't get this sometimes. A benevolent father and a good husband will be the most submissive within the family. But that brings us to question number two. What are the principles of submission? Well, there are several principles, but we're only going only to look at two because these two are the most important. The first one is known as the principle of reciprocal submission. So... If you're writing this down, just put down there the principle of reciprocal submission. But the word reciprocal actually means mutual. So this principle is also known as the principle of mutual submission. But more importantly, it means that God expects every Christian to be submissive to others whenever possible. Now, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 21, and I'm going to show you how this principle works. Notice what it says. And further, submit to one another out of reference for Christ. Now, I want you to notice that phrase, to one another. To one another does not distinguish between adults and children, husbands or wives, males or females, clergy or laymen. In fact, Paul doesn't make any exceptions or list any stipulations. He just says that Christian, Christians should voluntarily defer to others whenever possible. Or to say it another way, you should voluntarily place what you want under what others want. Hupotasso. That's what submit means. Now let me give you an example of parents submitting to children. When our kids were, were little, eating out was special. It's not like it is today that everyone eats out. I don't care what your uh, 
where you are on the poverty scale, everyone seems to eat out. But when I was growing up, it wasn't that way. And when we went into ministry, we were poor. So with my kids, when they were little, it was kind of a treat to eat out. So I would tell the family, hey, we're going to go eat out. And I always hated what was coming because let me just tell you, my kids always wanted to eat at McDonald's. And I hate McDonald's. That's crap food. Now, most of you kids grew up on that, going to these ball games, and you love McDonald's. But McDonald's is horrible. But guess where we would eat? McDonald's. Yeah. Now, there were a few times I would say, where do you all want to eat besides McDonald's? Yeah. Now, let me give you another example of a husband submitting to his wife. We recently remodeled our kitchen. We put in new granite countertops, and we put in a new backsplash, and we did a few other things. Now, who do you think chose the granite and the backsplash? All the other things. My wife did. She made the final decision. She's the one that would choose. In fact, many times she would, we were looking at granite, and she would say, so what do you think about this one? And I said, boy, I really like that one. And it was almost like, we don't want that one. <laughs> But that's the way it seemed to go, but that's okay. I've, I've come to understand that. In fact, if you think about this, Jesus' life was the perfect example of mutual submission. Look at with me, if you would, in Mark chapter 10, verse 37, and then we're going to jump down and read verses 43 through 45, and you'll see what I'm talking about. In fact, let me kind of set the scene for you. The disciples are finally beginning to realize that Jesus is the Messiah. And the Messiah is supposed to do what? The Messiah is supposed to bring the kingdom of God to this earth. And so James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they're thinking when he sits on his throne, we would like to be there with him. We would like to share some of the, that authority. So let's read verse number 37. It says, they replied. Who's they? James and John, the sons of Zebedee. When you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you. One on your right and the other on your left. Now, if you know the story, the other disciples got upset with James and John. But the only reason they got upset is because they thought of it first. And they're thinking, why didn't I think of that? Now, notice what Jesus says to James and John. This is verses 43 through 45. But among you, it will be different. In other words, you guys are thinking like the world. But we're not of the world. The kingdom of God is not of this world. So he says, but among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. And to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, in serving others, what we're really doing is submitting to them. You're placing yourself under them. That's what hupo tasso means. Hupo means under. Tasso means to place. So when it comes to serving, you're placing what you want, what you desire, what you want to do with your time, all of that under what someone else wants or needs or desires. There's a hierarchy here. So you serve them, which in a sense means you're submitting to them. You're deferring to them. You're doing things for them. In fact, do you know what makes a marriage successful? I'll give you the number one thing. If you were to list all the things that makes a marriage successful, the number one thing on the list would be mutual submission. Yeah. When each spouse places what they want under what the other wants. Yeah. Because when you have both parties doing that, you're going to have a good marriage. That's what makes a marriage successful. Now, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 22. We already read verse number 21. Let's read verse number 22. And then I'm going to ask you a question. So let's read that passage of scripture. Here it is. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, how many of you wives go, I hate that verse. I know you hate it. You know how I know you hate it? Because I have mother-in-laws come to me when I'm going to perform or officiate a, a wedding. They come to me and they say, can I hear what the vows are going to be? I'll say, sure. I'll put it to us. You go, okay, I just want to make sure that you're not going to say that my daughter has to obey her husband. I said, well, no, I wasn't going to say that. Well, I just want to make sure you're not. I'm not. You've already read them. Are you sure you're not going to change them? 
I mean, women get caught up in this, but I understand that. Because when we think of submission, it, we think of something that's really bad, and men have really abused it. So this is one of the most hated scriptures in the Bible. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband, or unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, here's the question. Does Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 negate the principle of mutual submission in verse 21? See, these two verses, they're there. We're supposed to submit one to another, and immediately it goes into wives submitting to husbands. So you have mutual submission, and then you have this. Wives are supposed to submit to their husband. So does verse 22 negate verse 21? No. But it does introduce the second principle that I want to teach on this morning. Here's the second principle of submission. If you're taking notes, write this down. God expects everyone to submit to those in authority. Let me say it again. God expects everyone to submit to those in authority. In fact, let me give you some fundamental truths from God's word. First, whenever God gives a person responsibility, he also holds that person accountable. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 2, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Notice what it says. Now, a person who's been put in charge as a manager must be faithful. Why must he be faithful? Because God is going to hold him accountable. It's that simple. Whatever you're responsible for, you're accountable for. It's that way in the work world. If your boss says you're responsible for this and you don't get it done, he's going to hold you accountable. God works the very same way. Whatever you're responsible for, God's going to hold you accountable for. As the pastor, I have certain responsibilities. One day I'm going to stand before God and God is going to hold me accountable for what I did as the pastor of Cornerstone Fellowship. Yeah, that's true. Secondly, second fundamental truth. God will never make a person responsible for something without, without also giving him the authority to fulfill his responsibility. Let me say that again because that's important. God will never make a person responsible for something without also giving him the authority to fulfill that responsibility. And let me give an example. Look with me, if you would, in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. This is a familiar passage of Scripture. It says, everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid. For they have the authority to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. In other words, when we think about this, we think of people like those in the military or those in the police. Uh, they're police officers. And that's what it's really talking about. Police have been given the responsibility to keep law and order. But with that responsibility comes the authority to arrest people or to write tickets. If the police did not have the authority to arrest people and to write tickets, then no one would listen to them. No one would submit to them. No one would obey them. I wouldn't. And I'm a pastor. If I was driving home and a, and a police car came behind me, turned on its lights, and I realized they don't have the authority to arrest me, they don't have the authority to write me a ticket, you know what I keep doing? I just keep right on driving. I go home. I get out of the car. Policeman come up to me and says, you know what you did? Say, it doesn't matter. You don't have any authority. I don't care what I did. You don't have the authority to do anything about it. But they do have the authority. We have given them the authority to enforce law and order. That's what this scripture is talking about. Now, why does that come out of the Bible? That comes out of the Bible because God is the one who instituted this principle. He makes people responsible for certain things. Therefore, he gives them the authority to make sure that they can do what they're responsible for. I'll be honest with you. You look at the writing, the things that are taking place. 
Let me just say something really simple to you. Know your rights and comply. I don't care if, if the police officer is being rude. I don't care if he's asking you to do things you shouldn't do. You comply. You can go back later. And you can get a lawyer and you take care of it. But when a police officer tells you to do something, you do it. Why? Because we're told in the book of Romans that God set up the governing authorities. And we're supposed to submit to those who are in authority. So, what in the world does this have to do with wives submitting to their own husbands? Well, if you remember, God holds the husband responsible for the spiritual and physical welfare of his family. And with that responsibility comes authority. And I'll give you an example. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8. It says, but if anyone... Now, this is referring to men. How do you know it's referring to men? Because if you continue reading on in this verse, the personal pronoun that is used is masculine. Now, someone might say, well, they do that often, but it can refer to male or female. Not in Greek. So when you're reading this in the original Greek and you get to the personal pronoun, it's written in the masculine form. So when it says, but if anyone, it really means if any man. If any man does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he, there's that masculine pronoun, the man, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So what this is telling us is the husband is financially responsible for the family. Therefore, when it comes to the finances, he has authority over them. He has the final say. But do you know what upsets women more than anything else about submission to men? It's the fact that most men will not accept responsibility, but they want authority. Let me say that again. Most men will not accept responsibility, but they want authority. Women, does that irritate you? You're not going to answer, are you? If I was a woman, that would irritate me. It would. I'll give you an example of this. Lisa's better at the day-to-day -day finances than me, and I'm better as a visionary, so I'm responsible for taking care of our retirement. She's responsible for the day-to-day -day finances. Now, when I first delegated the job to her, I was doing it, and you know, I realized that she was just better at it. So I came to her and I said, you know, I, I want you to take over the finances. You pay the bills, you do the budget, you do whatever. Well, she was doing that, and I guess she was doing a good job. I didn't check up on her. But I would come to her and I'd say, let's go to the movies and eat out this Friday night. And my wife would say, we'll see. And I would think, oh boy. We're going to get to go to the movies and eat out. Well, I didn't really, I'm, I'm not that smart. I didn't really pick up that every time she said that, we didn't do it. Until we had children. And when we had children, our kids would grow up and they would want something. They'd so go ask your mom. And they'd go and ask her and she'd say, we'll see. And it didn't take me long to realize every time she said, we'll see, that meant they're not going to get to do it. And then it dawned on me, that's what she says to me. So I go to her and I said, you know, I make the money. You're standing home with the kids. I'm out there. I'm working. I'm working hard. I think every once in a while, if I want to say, let's go see a movie and eat out, we ought to do that. And she says, okay, fine. Here's the checkbook. Well, I don't want that. She said, well, if I'm responsible for the finances and we have this bill coming up and we have this bill coming up and the insurance is going to come around and this is going to be here and we got to make sure you said the tires are getting kind of bold and we're going to have to put new tires on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, we won't eat out and go to the movies. You see, here's the problem. I wanted to delegate the responsibility to Lisa, but I did not want to delegate the authority for the finances to her. And early on in our marriage, I realized I can't give her the responsibility without also giving her the authority. And it works the other way around. I'm responsible for retirement. I want to make sure that when we get to that point where you guys say, I don't want you to be pastor anymore, Alan. And that day will probably come when I tell the same story three times in the very same sermon. <laughs> Someone's going to say, we got to get rid of the guy. Well, I want to maintain the same style of living that I have right now. So my responsibility is to make sure that we have enough money at retirement to maintain our current standard of living. 
So whenever we get a raise, I go to Lisa and I say, okay, we got a raise. But this much has to go to our 401k. And we need to be putting money also on top of the 401k into an IRA. So this is going to have to go there. And Lisa would go, whoa, 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 we need that. And I said, no, I'm sorry if we want to maintain this. So I said, we've lived off of this before. Now we're getting a raise. So all I'm saying is a portion of that raise has to go here. And guess what? She would submit to me because I'm responsible for taking care of retirement. And if I'm responsible for it, then I have the authority to say how much money needs to go in there for us to be able to save enough to maintain our current standard of living when we retire. This is how it works with submitting to those who are in authority. But the reason they're in authority is because they have responsibility. So let me say the second, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's okay. Let me give you the second principle of submission again, if you didn't write this down. God expects everyone to submit to those in authority. And it doesn't matter how it, how it is. God expects that. If the football coach is responsible for the team winning, then he has the authority to call the plays. He has the authority to make all the decisions. That's the way it works. Who's ever responsible has the authority to make the choices and decisions because it's up to them. They're going to be held accountable as to whether or not they fulfill that responsibility. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The reason it says that is because parents have a responsibility to raise their children the right way. Therefore, they have the authority to make those decisions. That's also why parents tell their kids, as long as you live under my roof, you'll obey my rules. You want to know why? Because they're responsible for the people under their roof. Now, once their children become uh, wise enough and mature enough to be able to make it on their own, and they become responsible for their own life, with their own finances, and listen to me, college students, just because you go to college does not mean you're responsible for your life because mom and dad's still footing some of the bill. But when you can get out there and you support yourself and you're responsible for paying all of your bills, guess what? You now have the authority. And the Bible no longer says that you're to obey your parents. It says you're to honor your parents. That's good teaching, Pastor Allen. Now, whenever you don't know which principle to use in a particular situation, in other words, you want to know, do I submit to them or are they supposed to submit to me? Is this a case of mutual submission or is this a case of submitting to those who are in authority? When you don't know what to do, you need to use the submission test. In essence, the submission test determines whether you should submit to others or whether they should submit to you. And sometimes you're put in a situation and you're kind of in a fight here and you don't know who's supposed to make the decision. And we have to make a decision here. Who submits to who? Well, that's when you use the submission test. Because it determines whether you should submit to them or they should submit to you. And this submission test applies everywhere. It applies in the church. It applies at home. It applies in the workplace. There's not a place where this submission test does not apply. And it's a very simple test in that it consists of only one question. And this is the question. Does God hold me responsible for this? Let me say that again. Does God hold me responsible for this? Now, let me give you some examples to illustrate how this test works. Lisa and I would like to sell our home and build a new home. That's kind of a hard decision because our house is paid off. We don't owe a penny on it. You know, that was part of my responsibility. My responsibility is prepare for retirement. You don't ever retire unless your home's paid off. So I had to go. We're going to get this home paid off. But now that the home's paid off, Lisa and I are kind of thinking about, should we sell our home and build another home? Because I want to move my library home. All of my books, and you might not know this. Julie might correct me. She actually does my library, so she can tell me if I was wrong or not. But I have close to 7,000 volumes. 7,000 thousand volumes of books and I want to move my library home and there is no place to put 7,000 volumes of books in the house that we have 
If I translate that for you, it means Lisa won't let me. So I want to build a new home with a library to move my library home. So at night I can study. I do whatever I want to do. And Lisa would like to have a personal place to work out, a, a, a home gym. So we're in the process of trying to design a home that we want to build. And here's the problem. We have different tastes. What I like, she doesn't necessarily like. And what she likes, I don't necessarily like. So we've got a dilemma here. Should I submit to Lisa when we're designing this home or should she submit to me? After all, I am the husband of the home. And I do make the bulk of the income. And Paul said, wives, submit unto your own husbands. Can I hear an amen? But Paul also said that we should submit to one another whenever possible. Yeah. Look back. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's read verses 21 and 22. Here it is. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So you've got the principle of mutual submission in verse 21. And the principle of submission to authority in verse number 22. So which principle applies? Lisa thinks that verse 21 applies. I think verse 22 applies. Which principle applies? How do we determine that? The submission test. Yeah. And to employ the test, I ask myself, does God hold me responsible for the style of home that I live in? Someone's pretty smart. God does not hold me responsible for the style of home that I live in. He doesn't care what style of home I live in. He doesn't care whether it's a farmhouse style or it's a French chateau or it's blah, blah, blah. He doesn't really care. So I don't have the right to try and exercise my authority in an area in which God doesn't hold me responsible. That's good, so I'm going to repeat it. I don't have a right to try and exercise my authority in an area in which God does not hold me accountable or responsible. Therefore, the principle of mutual submission applies and not the principle of submission to authority. Does that make sense? Only, only if you want to do what God says. If you don't want to do what God says, that does not make sense, Pastor Allen. Yeah. Bottom line is, Lisa gets her way. Why? Well, remember, a benevolent father and a good husband will be the most submissive within the family. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Now, let's do another example that's a little trickier. Lisa has expensive taste. She really doesn't. But my, but my example will not work unless I say that, all right? So she doesn't have expensive taste. But I'm going to say that she has expensive taste for the sake of the example that I'm using. So she's designing our future home without regard to cost, but not me. I'm looking at what is this going to cost? So what if she wants to do something that I think we can't afford? Who submits to who? Well, let's employ the test. I ask myself, does God hold me responsible for the style of home that I live in? And the answer obviously is no. However, I have to ask another question. So I ask, does God hold me responsible for the family finances? And the answer is what? Yes. So I have the authority to say, I'm sorry, but we can't afford to do that. And according to God's word, she's to submit to my authority. But, there's always a but. But, she still gets to choose the style as long as we can afford it. So we compromise. She gets her style, though it might be her second choice and not her first choice. And I get what we can afford. Sounds like a winner to me, right? Men say no. Yeah, it's a winner. Trust me, it's a winner in the bedroom. <laughs> so does everyone understand the submission test? Now, earlier I said that a benevolent father and a good husband will be the most submissive within a family. And I also said that I would explain why a little bit later, and it's later. So let me explain why a benevolent father and a good husband will be the most submissive within a family. And let me start by giving you another principle. 
I told you I was only going to give you two, but I lied. I'm going to give you a third one. It's very, very important. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Submission, especially as it, as it pertains to mutual submission, is a byproduct of love. Let me say that again. Submission, especially as it pertains to mutual submission, is a byproduct of love. In fact, let me prove that to you. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. Now, in this passage of Scripture, Paul is describing the characteristics of true love. If you want to know what true love is, agape love, these are the characteristics. And if the type of love someone has for you doesn't have these characteristics, it's not true love. So when I'm officiating a wedding ceremony, many times I'll talk about, before the vows, the responsibility to love each other. And I'll say, now let me explain what love is. And I turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 5, and I specifically apply it to marriage. But notice what it says. Love is patient. When you're not patient with your spouse, you're not loving them. Love is kind. When you're not kind, there's no love. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Some of you are rude to your spouse. That's not love. True love has these characteristics. But here's the one I want you to see. It does not demand its own way. Do you see that? True love does not demand its own way. Instead, it allows others to have their way. That is so good, I'm going to repeat it. True love does not demand its own way. Instead, it allows others to have their way, which is what submission is all about. Submission is deferring to others. It's allowing them to make the decision or to choose what they want. Do you know how Lisa knows that I love her? She knows because I submit to her wants, desires, and wishes, if at all possible. You see, I'm a very selfish person, and Lisa knows that. She knows that. I like things my way. But my love for Lisa compels me to let Lisa have her way rather than me having my way. In other words, it compels me to submit to her. Because I love her, I just love making her happy. Same thing with my kids. My love for them compels me to let them have their way rather than me having my way. People, I don't like Wingstop. If you like Wingstop, something's wrong with you. But I don't tell my kids that. My kids love Wingstop. And we eat there all the time because my kids like it. And that's the way love works. Love does not demand its own way. Now, if they're watching this, Usually Mike and Aaron, they're watching my sermon. Macy will watch my sermon later. They're probably going, I never knew Dad didn't like Wingstop. Hint, hint, kids. But anyways, <laughs> we'll say, where are we going to eat? And they'll go, let's see the Wingstop. And you know what I go, okay. And inside I'm thinking, okay, what can I choose? The least of what I hate. Yeah, yeah. But you see, Love does not demand its own way. Because I love my kids, I want them to have their way. And I didn't even know till one day I'm reading 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. It says, love does not demand its own way. And for the first time I go, huh, that's why I'm a very selfish person. But when it comes to my wife and my kids, I'm not. I've always told my kids, I work for you. Everything I have is yours. But I'll say this. I've since told them since I have grandkids, you're not getting anything. My grandkids are getting it all. <laughs> Bob Tino's grandkids are great. Everyone told me they would be, but I had no idea until I had them. Now, if you're single, I want you to listen to me. Some of you cannot pick a good person to save your life. Some of you have been married three and four times. And you're thinking, man, I, I've got a problem. 
Yeah, you do. It might not be them. Might be. But anyways. But the problem might be you don't know how to choose someone. So singles, listen to me. If you're dating someone and they're always manipulating and working to get their way, run. Because they don't love you. Not the way they're supposed to. Because true love does not demand its own way. Instead, it compels a person to put the other person's wants and desires above their own. In other words, it compels them to submit to the other person. People, that's true love. It does not demand its own way. Now, I will say this. Some people are incapable of having true love for others. Something's wrong with them. And you need to run from those type of people. So if you're single and you're dating someone and it seems like they always choose the restaurant. They always do what they want. If you bring up something you'd like to do and no, uh, there's a reason we can't do that. And they're always doing what they want. I want you to understand something. They will not be a good mate. Because a, a good mate's going to love you and true love does not demand its own way. In fact, true love wants to make sure that you get your way. Now, don't get me wrong. There's got to be a little balance to it. Lisa's such a good wife. In fact, sometimes the things that irritate both of us is I'm deferring to her and she's deferring to me and someone's got to give in. <laughs> Just pick a restaurant. But you know what I've noticed with women? They'll say, I don't care. And then you say, okay, so let's go there. Anywhere but there. Then you do care. Okay, sorry. But I want you to understand, this submission thing is not what people make it out to be. I know there are pastors who preach it wrong, but if you take what the Bible has to say, you'll find out that submission is not a bad thing. In fact, as Christians, we should be naturally submitting to others. I'll go a little bit further. In Galatians chapter 6, verse number 2, I've got to wrap this up quick. In Galatians chapter 6, verse number 2, it tells us to carry one another's burdens, therefore fulfilling the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Well, there's one commandment that Jesus Christ gave us that, that exceeds them all. I'm not talking about the greatest commandment and the second that's like unto it. He, was, he told us what the greatest commandment in God's word is. But Jesus actually gave us a commandment. And this is the law of Christ. Does anyone know what it is? We'll look in John chapter 15, verse 12. It says, this is my commandment, that you love one another. Now, here's the kicker, as I've loved you. You want to know something about Jesus? The Bible tells us, wives, submit unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And then he's making this comparison that as the church submits to Jesus Christ. But you know what's kind of interesting about Jesus? Jesus does most of the submission. He's made the greatest sacrifice. I can promise you Jesus did not want to die on a cross. He did not want to be whipped. He did not want to have a crown of thorns. He did not want to be pierced in his side. He did not want his soul to descend into hell to be penalized or to be punished for your penalty, for your sin. How do you know that, Pastor Allen? Well, who would want to do that? But more importantly, Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if, this be, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. You know what he's saying? God, if there's any other way to save them, don't make me do this. It lets me know. You don't want to do it. But you know, we all want forgiveness. We all need salvation. We all desire to go to heaven. So you know what Jesus did? He put our needs, our wants, our desires above his own. He went to the cross. He descended into hell. He paid the penalty for our sin. When Jesus came, he was always serving others. To the point that once he even took his disciples out of the country, they left Israel. They went up to Tyre and Sidon, and a woman there recognized him. He was up there to have a kind of a vacation because the people wouldn't leave him alone. 
His own family thought, man, he's going to go crazy. He's ministering day and night. He tried to get away from the people and they get in boats and follow him across the Sea of Galilee. He was so tired, but you know what? He always put people's wants, needs, and desires above his own. That's the kind of Savior we serve. And then he gives us this command. You love others the way I've loved you. And what does love do? It does not demand its own way. Jesus never demanded his own way. He always put our desires above him and let us have our way. And you know, it's like that in our Christian life when we accept Jesus. Well, Jesus has Lord. Well, yes, he is. But you know what's interesting? Whenever he tells us no, it's because it's always for our good. You know what I found out about God in Jesus? They say yes to me all the time. God, can I have that? Yes, you can. Can I do that? Yes, you can. Can I do that? No, you can't. Why? And then he'll reveal why it's bad for me. Because he's responsible. You hold him responsible for helping you not screw up your life. So if he tells you no, it's because he's responsible to help you. Therefore, he has the authority to tell you no. Now, 